Good evening. I'm Zach Johnson here with a special news report from Oregon State University. So currently, students and parents are paying thousands and thousands of dollars to send their children to universities around the country. But is your money being wasted? This is a special news report from Dr. Aaron Gallagher's Communication and Organizations class, where we're going to be looking at the organizational structure and communication, particularly in large lectures offered and at college-level courses. Our insiders here at Oregon State University will be offering us some special insight into this growing dilemma. We're going to look at some of the some issues, including organizational culture in these large lectures. We're also going to be taking a closer look at the flow of communication between professors and the students in these large lectures, as well as the flawed philosophy of one best way in these large lectures. Unlike many news reports, though, we're hoping to end by offering some solutions for universities and students uh, to get more out of the experience. So first, let's go to Matt, who's going to explain more about the structure of these large lectures. Thanks, Zach. We're here outside Milam Hall at Oregon State University. It's one of the largest lecture halls here at OSU. Uh, yeah, this lecture hall can, in particular can hold up to 750 students. Uh, students will have to take a class like this two to three times a week, ranging from 80 to 50 minute classes. Uh, this, coupled with the large student population, is a recipe for disaster for teachers trying to communicate with their students. We're going to take a sneak peek inside and see how these classes can function. As you can see, these lectures are often overcrowded, making it hard for students to be involved or participating. This is a very real problem that needs to be addressed. Now let's go to Decker, who's going to go more in depth on a problem these classes can create. One of the most prevalent issues in these large lectures is the style of teaching it promotes, often called the one best way method. The one best way theory originated when a man named Frederick Taylor was trying to find the most efficient way for his workers to work. The same idea has been applied to universities and lecturing. The most efficient way to get thousands of students through entry-level classes with limiting funding is large lecture halls. The problem is this one best way to get large amounts of students through school is not the best way for students to learn. Some of you may know there are many types of learning um, learners that learn in different ways, such as experiential learners who learn best through doing activities, collaborative learners who learn best through working in groups, independent learners who learn best on their own, and then there's audio learners who learn best through listening. Large lecture halls really only appeals to audio learners. This means the majority of these supersized classes are going to have a hard time learning. There may be one best way to get large masses of students through school but there's no one best way to teach effectively. Thanks. It sounds to me, Decker, that although it is ultimately the student's responsibility to learn, that our professors need to make some big changes as well. Our other reporter, Sarah, now has this to add. Thank you, Zach. So what it really comes down to is that this type of structure in the classroom of one best way, where the teacher lectures up front, really inhibits the flow of communication from being a two-way interaction. The teacher gets a chance to communicate to the students, but then gets very little feedback as the students don't have the chance to communicate back unless they ask questions, which isn't always easy for everyone. The issue also is, how is it possible to really gauge how effective your lecture is until it's already time for the test? By then, it's already too late. The students have experienced the stress of not knowing all the information, especially if they didn't get the chance to really understand the material. At this point, the professor might have to result to curving the exams to keep enough students with a passing grade. Another problem with this style of teaching is with the actual communication that we're talking about here from the professor to the student. It becomes very hard for the student to stay focused when they are sitting there and solely listening to the professor lecturing for an hour or maybe even two. After about 20 minutes, their minds start to wander and soon all the communication becomes, if not ignored, definitely not retained. I mean, even I've seen students start dozing off when there's a little over 100 kids sitting around you. It's not like you're worried about the professor seeing this. Now back to you, Zach. Thanks, Sarah. On top of that, many students have also expressed to us how these issues have led to a poor organizational culture in the classroom. But what do we mean when we talk about organizational culture? Well, you can think of organizational culture as the values, norms, language, habits, attitudes, functions, and basic assumptions shared within an organization. If we look at the lecture here, we can think of the lecture as being the organization that we're addressing in our study. 
When looking at universities, though, it's important to keep in mind that the culture of a small fisheries and wildlife lecture can vary quite a bit from that of a large economics or mathematics lecture. But what, it is, what is it about the culture of these large lectures that's preventing our students from maximizing their classes? Within organizations that have excellent culture, we often see a close relationship between the organization, organization and customer. This is from a study by uh, Waterman and Peters. Here we see the organization being OSU, or the, um, <clears throat> the lecturer, the professor, um, that's the organization. The customer, in this case, is us, the students. Upon interviewing and polling students, we found that over 60% of students felt voiceless in large lectures, and the professors generally cared less about students in large lectures as compared to those in smaller ones. These issues make it very difficult for students and professors to have a close relationship and create the kind of positive culture needed for success. Although that's not always the professor's fault, uh, since you know, oftentimes they're teaching hundreds of students, it's still an issue that needs to be brought to our attention. So how do we go about fixing this? Well, the most obvious solution would be to simply reduce class sizes. This would increase the ability to create these close relationships and improve the culture. 91% of students we polled said that they'd prefer class sizes of 50 or less as compared to large lectures of over 100. But this is a highly unlikely solution as it doesn't make financial sense for the university. As William G. Tierney states in his article, Organizational Culture in Higher Education, which appeared in the Journal of Higher Education, we must remember that institutions are influenced by powerful external factors such as demographic, economic, and political considerations. So when we're discussing these organizational cultural issues, remember that we're not specifically trying to single out the lecturers as oftentimes they're limited by higher powers. Because of this, we propose a couple of alternatives. One includes simply increasing the amount of office slash accessibility hours to professors for students to meet with them individually and improve their relationships. In our research, we found that 84% of students who attended a large lecture only attended office hours zero to one times throughout the, throughout the term. Coinciding with this idea, we believe possibly making it a requirement to meet with your professor in classes above 100 students at least once throughout the term could be another possibility. You could also maybe add um, uh, extra credit, a point or two each time a student visits with a maximum amount of points they can get. In increasing this this desire, this, this um, need to meet with the professor will create that relationship we're talking about and improve the culture. Another solution we offer is the professor spending maybe the last five minutes of each lecture doing something to improve the culture of the classroom. Whether that's sharing a goofy video with the class to try to create a common bond, having a five minute open suggestion question period in which students can suggest new things to the professor, uh, explain things that aren't going well, or just simply clarification questions that can improve the culture, uh, we believe that improving the culture of these large lectures needs to be the goal of the university professors. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is when we're looking at these solutions, the, the idea of equifinality. This means that equifinality is the idea that there's multiple pathways to the same, the same result or goal or, or, or solution in this matter. So for, for that, we're going to pass this off to Sarah, who's going to offer us some more solutions or pathways how we could solve this. Those are all great ways of improving the culture of the classroom. And when that gets better, so does the flow of communication. There's other tools that teachers can use to increase this communication with their students as well. And we know that this is important because 70% of students we polled said that they would like their lectures to be more interactive. One tool professors have used in the past is electronic clickers. So this is just a little remote-like device that each student has on them, which then sends information to the computer that the teacher is using, depending on what buttons they press. If the professor were to put up quiz questions for the students to answer and say, make it worth class points, can give the students some motivation and incentive to pay more attention to what they're actually saying. It can also be used by the professor to get a feel for whether or not the students are understanding certain concepts and just in general feel of where the class is at. There's also this potential for students to realize other classmates were having the same difficulty on material that they were. This then not only increases the flow of the communication from students back to the professors, but it also shows the, fl the flow of information and communication going horizontally between the students themselves. It could then also bring up the opportunity for students to ask questions about anything they were confused on, and this could potentially lead to a class discussion or more commu communication. I asked a fellow OSU student a few questions about his personal experiences taking classes that use a large lecture classroom style, and here's what he had to say. I'm here with Taylor and he's a senior at OSU and I'm gonna ask him a few questions about what his experiences have been in a large lecture classroom style. So, what is the largest class that you've ever been in? 
Um, I would have to say I took a couple of science classes uh, a year ago and classroom sizes range from like 250 students to 300. Right. So did you face any like challenges with that size of class or did you like it or? Um, I mean, yes and no. Uh, I definitely found it challenging when um, other students were like on their laptops and like texting or just even like talking to um, each other. Uh, it's very distracting from like not only the professor and the material, but also like my own like learning mm -hmm. in a sense to being able to um, stay engaged in the topic and what, what the professor is talking about. Okay. So was it, how long of a class was it? Uh, it was only about like 50, 50 minutes. It was a 50 minute lecture class. Um, or I had that and then also a couple other classes that were an hour and 20 minute um, lecture classes as well. Mm -hmm. That's a long time. Yeah. So, I mean, it's definitely, I, one of the biggest things was probably uh, falling asleep a couple <laughs> times in the right. class. Um, it was just, I mean, sometimes it was hard to stay focused uh, when the professor's just up there talking for the whole time, not really uh, communicating with the, any of the students or just like anything really in general. Right. Yeah, I think we all experience that. <laughs> um, has any of your professors used the electronic clickers in your class, in your like large classes? Um, yeah, for, in a couple of them, they, um, they actually had like, I had two different clickers for a couple different classes, like a biology lab mm -hmm. clicker and then for another one. Um, so, was, I mean, I used them a lot and I definitely, uh, like them and could tell that they were a good incentive to go to class and like stay engaged in what the what the topic of the day was and stuff mm. and i mean so are they usually like quiz questions and you have to get the right answer yeah and it's so like it helped with my being like not only just staying focused in the on the topic but also like studying for the midterms or final and stuff because you knew that these questions these similar types of questions were going to be on the test mm -hmm. and so it was like good practice mm -hmm. so and just in general would you say that you learn better in a large class or a smaller size of class um i would say it's definitely a smaller size class because i'm more of like the hands-on type of learner and so i definitely need that um ability to like communicate closely with the professor, like just even before and after class or like um, engage with my, no, get to know my student, the, sorry, students next to me and stuff, like mm -hmm. just talking with them every day because in a large size class, um, you have different people always around you like each day. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you're always seeing different faces and stuff and versus in a small class, it's the same students. So you get to know them. Okay. Yeah. So do you ever go to your professor's office hours? Um, yeah, not as, not as much as I would like, but um, I would say at least a couple times a month, I would try and go and just ask questions and see what, um, see what the answer and what it was about. So you found it beneficial to go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely, um, not only like, helped with getting the answers to the questions, but I could tell, I uh, made the professor, like professors know that, you know, I was, um, I was putting the time to like come and see them and talk about the questions and then they would see me in class too. And like, you know, it was just a good thing for them to know that, hey, I'm here. Okay. I, I, I like the class right. and I want to be in it and stuff, yeah. so. Okay, well, I appreciate you giving me your perspective mm -hmm. and thanks. So and I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Sarah. That was a great interview. Now, we've heard a lot from the student side of large extra classes, but I wasn't satisfied. We needed both sides of the story. I sat down with Dr. Jay Penry of the Exercise and Sports Science Department here at OSU to find his perspective. Okay. Thanks for being with me today, Jay. Glad I could help. All right. So how long have you been teaching students with, say, more than 70 students? 
Uh, I've been teaching large lecture classes for about 10 years, uh, first at Linfield College and then here at Oregon State. Mm -hmm. And how have you liked it? Um, it has its pluses and minuses. I think that, you know, it's kind of fun to be in a large lecture course because it feels, you know, it's nice to be in front of that many students. It's kind of, it's nice to, it's like showbiz, you know, a little bit, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it also has its drawbacks. You don't really get to have this a personal relationship with the students as you would in a smaller class. Yeah, that's one of the biggest problems we see is uh, trying to get students involved. Um, do you see any specific issues in communicating with students? Uh, with such a large group of people, it seems like it would be hard to um, get to know them. Yeah, getting to know, to know all the students, know them by name. It's really, it's nice to know your students by name because you get a chance to, um, you know, if you, if you know somebody by name, you can call them by name engages them in a way that an impersonal large lecture class where everyone's just kind of a face doesn't. Um, I still try to engage the students by getting to know them through exercises in the lab, even though it's a large lecture class, dividing the class up into small groups and working in that way, yeah, that, that helps. Um, also by maintaining kind of a conversational style in a large lecture class also tends to keep students involved because they don't feel that it's just me talking at them. They feel like they're more able to ask questions and be engaged in that sort of environment. Mm -hmm. So you would think that the group projects are more, uh, more involved in, say, like a Scantron exam would be? Um, well, you, you have to, you know, as I've been in these large extra classes over a period of time, it's the evil of the Scantron, Scantron exam is inevitable, I think. Mm -hmm. um, that said, you can still write Scantron exams that require a little bit more advanced thinking than just straight multiple choice. Um, and you can also include other parts, other types of questions or um, exam sections that aren't Scantron involved, but still you know, are easier to grade in a large format like that. Mm -hmm. And um, there's part of me that will never get away from an essay. Every, every large lecture class that I've taught has a, had at least one essay question on each exam, which takes a fair bit of time to, to grade, but it does, I think, um, it shows the students my commitment toward teaching and my interest in their learning, and it also, I think, gives them practice at writing, which is something that is lost in those types of large classes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, one final question about uh, clickers. Mm -hmm. uh, many uh, classes use them. I don't think you do. I've never used the clickers. Is there a reason that you wouldn't? Um, I don't know. I, th I think that you're able to pull in students and engage them somewhat with clickers, but it also is relatively impersonal. Um, I like to have students feel safe enough, even in a large lecture class, that they can feel like they can speak up and ask questions. And I, I think that does happen in my classes. It doesn't perhaps happen as much as I would like. Um, but I still think that you can get that same sort of um, individual feedback from students without using the clickers. And I think, I don't know, I just feel like it's more personable. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's enough. Okay. Uh, thanks again for meeting with me. Glad I could. Glad I could meet you with you. Help. Glad I can help out. Yeah. It was great to talk to Dr. Jay Penry, who has a lot of experience in front of those large lecture courses. The interview really helped me realize that the relationship between professor and student is a two-way street. In those large lectures, it's so easy to become invisible and go the entire term without letting the teacher learn your name or even having a conversation with them. As Jay mentioned in the interview, it's important to use the time in lab where there are less students competing for attention to let your teacher get to know you and ask them the more detailed questions that they can't sufficiently answer in class. If the students see their professor as a human being and not just the lecturer, they will be more likely to be engaged and participate in class. Jay also called Scantrons a necessary evil, an apt description. But it's a quick and easy way to evaluate students on a large scale. So, but for teachers, it's still important to have at least one uh, involved question on each exam. Jay also mentioned group projects as a great way to engage and talk with their students. They provide an opportunity to interact and form connection with your peers within a class. 
These connections can help a student if they feel uncomfortable going directly to the teacher when there's an issue. Instead, they can go to their peers for help. Now let's see what Decker has to add. Professors must also be open and flexible to change. With each new class, teachers must change the lecture to match the students. The smaller the lecture, the more interaction between students you must have. According to many students, the easiest way to make a lecture more interesting is to tie it to a topic of interest of the students. This will increase their engagement and hopefully have them learn more. Professors can also appeal to different learning types by having students work on group projects and by creating hands-on activities. What do you think, Zach? Thank you, Decker. Although we offer some possible alternatives and solutions, it is important to keep everything in perspective. We're not blaming professors solely for this issue, as they are often limited by both time and resources. They also have many external pressures and requirements that they are forced to meet as well. With that, though, we believe that a change is required to come from above, and despite efforts from students and professors, it will take a concentrated effort from all members of the university to improve large lecture conditions and culture. Hopefully we have brought these issues to your attention, and you can see parallels to other situations in your, in your life, such as the workplace. Like any major problem, though, the first step is addressing the issue, which we have done here. That's it for tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Stay classy, Corvallis.